Hi, good evening. Welcome once again to the Gildai Fred Kisun Show. And we also coming to you live on YouTube. You can get it on the Guidance Critic page. It is a wonderful day. It is Wednesday and it's October 26. In a few days we'll be counting down lots of Christmas carols and lots of songs there. And it's a time to rejoice. But today we have some serious business at hand. I'm not in a very good mood. Hmm. Um, before Fred Kisun comes on, um, and he's going to introduce somebody here, a very, I, I would say, a very experienced man, somebody who's bring, been, I wouldn't say around the block, but he has a lot of um, institutional knowledge as to what would have transpired again for the, at least for the last three, four decades, I would say. Very experienced in politics, and he is in a very powerful position uh, where he's sitting right now. I would allow Fred Kisun to do that. But we must address this issue here today. I don't think any normal Guyanese person, at least the ones who want to see this country go forward, would endorse any kind of behavior from our people when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to abuse. Um, definitely Gilderi does not endorse that, and I think Freddie would echo the same thing. I want to believe so. And I don't think uh, the majority of um, uh, people who are, are looking forward to a country which is a first world country, which is a stable country, a law Biden country, would tolerate that. That's why this morning something, a video came to my attention yesterday. We had a guest a few weeks back, a very powerful man um, uh, when it comes to the history of the Anna because he would have caused or sparked a certain situation that eventually led to an election in 2020. And then we know what happened after then, Charandas Prasad. It seems as if uh, we have a tendency that it's okay to do certain things. Um, I'm not saying that we, we're here to, to, to put anybody and say that they're guilty. Everybody is innocent until proven. However, uh, videos and when you see certain uh, uh, events, for certain evidence come to light, uh, or certain things come to light, you could be able to draw a conclusion. And um, uh, Mr. Charandas Prasad holds no um, unimportant position. He's been recalled by the president from um, India. He was a high commissioner to India. He's a representative of this country. And those are things that we should uh, loudly say that it is not something that our, what our country stands for. Um, I don't understand how an event that could happen last year is now coming to light. How did it uh, happen now? whether the president was not aware of it. Whatever is the case, the president acted quickly. I think if it is that you would have to judge the president, you could be able to say that the president um, is not afraid to make decisions. However, it should be evenly and across the board. Uh, we would have seen recently the issue of O.C. Rogers also guests on the show. And these are things that we don't tolerate. And we should, we should open our mouths very big and say this is not what our country is about. We could do better. When you go low, we go a little high. So let's don't go low. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of good business or serious business to deal when it comes to our country today. And in our midst, uh, sitting with us here, is somebody who is involved with lawmaking, somebody who has a very important, very senior position. I will hand you over to my co-host, Freddie Kisun, who's going to do the honors. Institutional knowledge here between the two men. Freddie. Good evening to you wherever you are. Just briefly, I don't want to take away um, the time of Mr. Mansunide, Honorable Speaker of the House, but I am glad the President acted the way he did. I have known Chavandas Passat for more than 30 years. He's not a high and right friend. He's a very personal friend. People make mistakes, and that some of those mistakes can destroy their career. And unfortunately, I don't know what went into the head of um, Chavandas, but uh, I am glad the president acted. One of the things that I believe we should do, they, even if the opposition and civil society do not want to discipline their culprits, even if the government have to face a barrage of criticism, when their uh, uh, people misbehave, the government must take the high moral ground and do what is expected of government because 
the government's credibility is involved. Uh, what R.C. Rogers is alleged to have done, and Charandas Prasad alleged to have done, occur in the age of social media, where you could actually see a person driving through a red light. So, once again, the president has done, the president has done what is expected of him. And when you have these things in future, leading members of the government and the ruling party must forget about the barrage coming from the opposition and discipline their own. Gildar and I take up, have taken up too much time of uh, the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Mansoor Adi. He is our guest this evening, and the Speaker, I find it difficult to call him the Speaker, and to call him Mr. Nadir. The problem with people like us is that we've known each other for so long. In common parlance, you call it donkey years. That is very difficult for me to sit down next to Mansoor and say, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> but I will try my best, depending on the question, to say, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, on um, this program, the Gadavi Freddy Kisuncho, our guest is a long standing political actor and now a very, very important state actor. But I want the interview to go in an evolutionary stage and I want to bring out some dimensions of political history that will be recorded. If you're too young to know, well, you have to be 70% of the Guyanese population are under 45. Before the 1992 elections, Mansunudi did something that is kind of strange in terms of political history. And the explanation tonight will go down in the history books. So when the researchers are researching, they will know about this third party. Now, a little bit of history. Mansunudi resurrected a political party that went out in the 70s. It was started by one of the guy's most famous businessmen, Peter de Gard. The party was the United Force, and it catered mostly for Portuguese um, business people, the Portuguese petty bourgeoisie, the clay complexion Indian petty bourgeoisie, and the mulatto class. That was one of the most successful third parties in the Caribbean history, and then the clash came with Mr. Burnham when he became Prime Minister, and the United Force faded out. But here is the irony and the mystery now of politics from the 90s onwards. Mansoon Adi resurrected the United Force. Now here are the intriguing dimensions. He is not one of those white Indians that you see in the Bollywood films. He was not a, a businessman of any um, um, capital uh, uh, expanse. But yet he chose to continue the United Force. Well, what is strange about that you think a Portuguese guy or one of the Mulatto people with the memories of the 60s and 70s would have given a renaissance to the United Force. But it was a non-businessman and a non-white complexion Indian guy. And here is the intriguing part. He is a Muslim. Mansoor, what went on in the 90s, when the, in the late 80s, when we had this party, TUF, the United Force, headed by Mansoor Nadir, whose policy and motto at that time was to continue the legacy of Peter de Gaulle's United Force. Your answer may take up the whole um, program time. First, gentlemen, let me thank you for having me on the program this evening, and a special good evening to all your viewers, and happy Diwali to everyone also. You know, some countries celebrate Diwali for a whole week. Yeah, yeah, yes. So. Um, what happened? I left Guyana in 1974, but where I grew up in Hawk Street, or Boystown, I, during the tumultuous period of the early 60s, the party that was I, I was closest to as a kid, 
every day I pass along Charles Street and I look to the left, there was the United Force symbol on Charleston Government School. That was where the original headquarters was. And listening to the politics, I thought that the only party then, when I was just a babe, literally, uh, that party had the best platform. I happened to have gone away, did my business degree at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, an Alberta conservative country, uh, call it Republican, conservative, and I like the policies of free enterprise, uh, the Christian democratic values, or let's call it religious democratic values. Mm -hmm. And in 1980, um, after the first degree, we came home, and the issue for me of socialism and communism had torn Guyana apart. And so I picked up the phone, and I called the United Force headquarters in uh, New Garden Street and Rob Street, and I said, um, I want to join this party because it reflected my views. And that was the genesis, October 1980. And my first election was the 1980 elections. When I joined the party, we had the average age probably was about 62 years old. And I just now turning 20 something was the youngest person in the party. And I benefited from the experiences of Bertie Seeley, who walked with Peter Degar, with Marcellus Field and Singh, um, Jaina Ryan Singh Sr. You know, and that just sharpened my, my values with respect to business, the values, the chart of the United Force, when you read it, right, um, appealed to the United Nations Charter. And that was the genesis of me joining the UF. And then we had a, a short sojourn because the 1980s was a tough period, you know, brutal. And I, as part of the United Force Youth Movement, was in Jamaica at a conference, got in touch with more politicians, especially young ones, and it took off from there. I became the Secretary General of that group for 10 years and learned the politics from Belize to Suriname intimately. So that is what um, the experiences that I bring to the table. And at that time, which was between 1984 to 1995, I can say I sat in Eugenia Charles's kitchen having a chat with her on free and fair elections. I shared John Compton's office, John Compton of St. Lucia. Of St. Lucia. And literally the... Virginia Charles, the former peer of Dominica. Of Dominica. Just sort of, um, uh, James Mitchell was a St. guest Vincent, speaker yeah. at his um, convention, helped work with Keith Mitchell, having elected as uh, leader of the New National Party of in Grenada, um, close to Old Man Bird, the Brambles in Montserrat, Swan in Bermuda, Siaga, of in course, Jamaica. in Jamaica, um, Kennedy Simmons, very good friend, former Prime Minister Sinkitz Nevis. So I had the benefit of uh, working with youth groups, but interacting with all these heavyweights of the 80s and 90s in the Caribbean. And um, it, it really opened my eyes a number of things because you had the benefit of speaking with these political giants. You know, we were just coming off in 1983, the Grenada uh, invasion. Yeah. American right? invasion of Grenada. Yes. I, I call it invasion regardless of what happened, yeah. though the RSS had supposedly invited I was there when it happened. Sure. Right, yes. I was at Grenada's when the Cubans were building it. Yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of, a lot of history, um, but it was the U.S. Virgin Islands sitting with Governor Turnbull in the mansion in St. Croix, George Price in Belize, you know. These are real big heavyweights, and I happen to be 
in that transition period from those leaders to the contemporary ones now. And among my contemporaries are many people, former Prime Minister uh, Sinkitz, Denzel Douglas, Sam Condor, Deputy Prime Minister, Ozzy Walsh, a former Minister of Trade, and Dominica Stevenson King, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Keith Mitchell and I became and still remain good friends until today. So it's, um, it's been a very blessed um, journey that I've been on. Very rich political journey too. You have to put that in your autobiography. Which I don't like I don't like writing. No, no, not at all. In fact, I was in, uh, in Uruguay um, at the climate change with Minister Bart Vikram and, and we had a meeting of Caribbean um, speakers and we were talking and then somebody said the same thing to write the history. But we have YouTube, we have uh, Google, we have a lot of persons who are doing that. And I hated, I hated when um, politicians would come with their scrapbook and all their pictures, right? Because those stuff are boring to young people. So what I talk about here don't interest the 70% of the people in, of this country today, right? It will be good for researchers, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> well, thank you very much, there, Mr. Speaker. And I, I could probably, I find it very difficult to call you Mr. Speaker. I, I, I remember you as a former. You don't know him. So we have to be circumspect. How would you know that? You, you made a conclusion <laughs> like that off your own? Since I know him so long ago, uh -huh. I would know who he knows. So and you know that. That. Do you know that he has taught half of Guyana? <laughs> you know that? I don't know that. I, I learned that. In the I taught his daughter. Yeah, that's that's there, there we go. Um, Mr. Speaker, you were also, uh, before we head straight into... Yeah, brother and I exchanged a lot of good times and mm -hmm. light weight. Yeah, you yes. see that? Yeah. From yeah. No, 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 please, call the man, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. <laughs> you were also the Minister of Labour, and before we head straight into the run in the Parliament and a lot of fears was happening there, uh, we, uh, you would have had a lot of experience uh, with uh, moving some changes into the Labour environment. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, people holding on, like let's say trade unions, we see people there decades and decades and decades and they're stagnant. Um, how, what are your thoughts on that? I want to hear that. And we have several of them, I could call them GPSU. Um, GPSU is 35 years. 35 years. Lincoln Lewis is 30 years. 30 years. Now it's winter, it's about 25 or between and, 20 years. And you don't see any movements in terms of growth. I, I see now the GPSU, um, uh, is that the GPSU? Some of the um, credit union. No, that, that's nothing to do with GPSU. No, no, but, but what I'm saying, it, it shows as if there's one set of players all the time. And now people are trying to shake the apple cart. There's a pushback on it. But I want to hear your thoughts. Mr. Speaker or um, former minister, as uh, so what do you think um, or what are your thoughts on that? Should there be some shake-up? Should somebody just wake up and say we need to revive, strengthen? What do you think? I, I strongly believe we have to have a lot of nurturing and those like myself who have been around a long time, we need to step away a bit. I always say if we go into the forest, um, we see all these big trees. If you don't cut down a big one, you never know if a better one is going to grow up. But in, the, in our forest, uh, we have thousands of saplings where they are struggling for some sunlight and growth. And unlike trees that can live centuries, we have a short span. And we need to have that transition. So, yes, I, can, I, I came back on the scene as speaker, but I've seen in our country where younger people have made significant impacts in terms of changes in life. The change don't come from, you really got to be exceptionally gifted to, to bring about change or have at your fingertips the ability to enforce your will on people. And that's where I deviate. I deviate from many countries because one should not enforce your will on people. Put your ideas out for a contest, and if they, they get the support, then you, you implement. 
the issue of labor is continuing to dominate um, the topics. Many organizations, business I've been talking to, have been complaining bitterly about shortage of labor. It may be a good thing. Maybe it's being drawn by, by the oil and gas. Whatever is the case, um, the topic, uh, eventually we'd have to start talking about the changing demographics uh, that is going to be happening. Because if you're going to be important uh, workers, if you're going to be immigrants is a, is a thing that we'd have to deal with, and we're dealing with it right now. How should Guyana prepare for something like that? What are, what do you believe that is going to happen in the next five, six, ten years? Uh, it, it's a conversation I've been having with many persons. Uh, I have five years from now, at any one time, the resident population in Guyana will be a minimum of about two million people. Half of those will be non-citizens. Like Qatar. Yeah. Yes. And 10 years, 15 years down, uh, Emirates right now has, I think, uh, about a million persons and five million workers and five million tourists. So, y you, you will see that. What we need to do, I think, one, um, my own view, and maybe I should be circumspect in saying this, but I think we should make it easy for a person coming in here and wanting to get a job, right? Have them at least register and make their contribution. Because too many persons are held ransom who are coming in. Um, secondly, we have to change the laws of Guyana to ensure that we can tighten up on who becomes a Guyanese. Not because we have oil, but because we have a small population and we can be easily swamped. So I believe very strongly that marrying a Guyanese shouldn't give you automatic citizenship. Um, in, in Emirates, I, I had the opportunity of being driven around by the speaker's uh, driver. And he was there for 26 years from India and still can't get citizenship, right? You don't have to make it that hard. But we're going to have to protect, in my view, Diana for Guyanese. I can't agree with what you're saying, given the fact that we are all over the world and we are, uh, um, um, Mr. Speaker, every half of a Guyanese, not one, has someone in another country. And when you take the total population of Guyanese, we are 760. There are about a million more out there. And we keep going. At one time, the United States... The Embassy United States statistic was 4,000 Guyanese a year. That, that was... No, no, he's saying... No, 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 he's saying... No, saying no, he's saying... No, 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 every country... He's does, saying that's every country does that. But if you, if you marry a Guyanese, if you marry a Guyanese, then the, the law kicks in. You're entitled to, um, after a period of time, citizenship. We, uh, I, I, I didn't like, uh, maybe didn't mean it that way, but I didn't like when he said, we must make it harder. We must make it, um, we must make it uh, presentable according to the law. You cannot, you cannot culture it in any language, you have a country to protect. I, I, you have to this, you, lived, you but, lived in St. Martins, you know. It doesn't what matter. Were, wait, what wait, were you on. doing in St. Martins? Hold on, hold on. What were you doing in St. Martins? I went there to work. But no, why? What was the issue? To work. No, nobody's saying that. We had this yeah. conversation before. But why, why, right. why are you... Why are you listening to what no, I'm no, saying? I don't want to listen to what you have to say. Why I I the word I use was tighten up. That's what it might have said, Bartles. Tighten up. You don't have to tighten up anything. The law, yeah. the, because the law kicks in. If you marry a Guyanese, there's no tightening up. Right, because so the law, law kicks, kicks in. We're going to wake up all the way. Yeah, 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 I, 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 I told, I told you this a million That's times. Opinion, and I'm going to say, I told you this a million That's times. Opinion, and I'm going to say it again. The only nationality in the world that has no right in natural law and in moral law to speak about people shouldn't come here and we got to be careful. The only nationality that does not have that right 
is Guyanese. We have gone all over this place and we are going. We are going. And we are going. What we are saying is that. Can you call us? Can so you, you want to can you so call, it's acceptable? Can you call anyone in this country? It's acceptable that you open the door and let the front gates open. Why are you putting it that way? But that's what you're saying. Front gates. Because if you're not. St. Martin's open the front gate and you were there. No. Oh, they did I not jump through the hurdles to get there, my friend. When people jump into the hurdles to no, come not the same. You think they're just coming out like that? Freddie Kiss, you know you live in At head least head. I'm glad. No. I'm glad the invers- the, this conversation now. You have your head buried in public. the sand. Because I think we need to have it. You have your we head buried in the sand, Freddie. If you know, I am telling you, no. I suspect you anti immigrant. And I'm warning you as a that Chinese. Man, I'm warning you, you, you as a Chinese. I have a right to express myself. You do not have a right to keep people out of this country. When you, you are reading this country. wrong because you're deliberately yeah. reading it wrong, it's got to be that you don't want to defend this country. I don't, protect it. I don't, I don't like your term defending. People should come you here don't and live. Like like I don't have to like it, Freddie I was guessed this is crossfire. Thank you very much. <laughs> you don't have to like what I'm saying. Yes. I'm you defending much. Guyana by hoping people come in here and help to develop no, it. No, but you cannot open the door. Look at all these The Americans open their visa and you would see how much people would go into the people's place. So, yeah. America. What nonsense you like to say? You listen to what you're saying? No, I'm not going to open the gates. Yeah, I'm not going to open the gates. United States has serious problems. We have a guest here. United States has the large properties and guys keep running there you have to stop that thing stop I suspect right, Freddy. Roy Clement Roy was here and he said he detect xenophobia in you he said that? yeah he said are you xenophobic? no are you some ask, sort? Asking Let, you, you, you we, had, ask me we had a guest here we had a guest Freddy, we had a guest here you cannot have a conversation with, with you over the flood gates you have the why are you using loaded prejudice terms Which about flood gates right? what do you mean about flood gates Freddy Kisson do what you know the things that the, uh, the people in I don't country? want to know I, can ask for I don't want do you know to know that? do you know do you have a, could you hazard let me ask the Mr. Speaker in a very respectful manner He's again. Stop this anti-immigrant thing you're going on you here. Have you have taken You don't want to address the issue. You know what? Guyanese and Guyanese have no right to, Why? to be. Because. Uh, because. Let me ask because you something now. I let me ask you something now. Be honest. Be honest, be honest with me. Be honest with me now. What is wrong with you? Be, honest, the hard be like honest with me now. That you don't make it as I am easy going to say this to you. That's all we're saying. This all I am going to say this to you. Not as easy. I'm going to say this to you. The man said don't make it easy. Name me how many relatives and uh, family members that you have outside. You want that you can let's go on your finger and name them. You know, so you have your head buried in the sand, you're missing the I'm point. I'm not my head buried right? in the sand. Are you gonna allow I'm me? going to confront people like you who are anti immigrant. Who's anti immigrant? I'm going to confront because we have gone to people no, all over the place. There's nothing wrong in me saying, get Larry saying that we have to protect this country. Yes, there's, there's, a, why? there's a lot wrong in saying that. Because in saying that, it shows you're fighting by us. That what is wrong with me saying we have to protect the You're using, you're using bad language. Who bad you language? You are using loaded prejudicial language. That is your opinion. The language you use tells what is so your that opinion. So only predicates don't have an opinion in this country? Some opinions can be xenophobic and dangerous. That is your opinion. Some not opinions, mine. and I suspect. So that? I suspect you the, don't want people coming into this country. Hold on, hold on. The and you have relatives the house, outside. The speaker of the house just made a statement, and you missed he the statement. Said, you said you did not. No, no. The he said something innocently, and you held on. Oh, yes, innocently. The man said something innocently. The man said, on said it. "Forgive me, Mr. Speaker. I must apologize for that. I I want to apologize to the guests here, but this is an issue that has been so bugging me. All right. It has been bugging me because I do believe, as a citizen in this country." I'm not saying for us to say stop immigration. Exactly. If you I, cannot stop it, the president and everybody says that we need to import labor. I agree with that. We don't have it yeah. here. I could tell you I have a business. The second thing that I would say to you is that if you go to the American Embassy now, there's a reason why you go to the American Embassy. You'd have to get a visa. If you go to the American Embassy now and you want uh, 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 an applicant or you want to make an application for a visa, it's several months on the line. They didn't do it because they want to stop people from coming to the country. The well, we is, have that requirement oh, Jesus, too. Are you to your own opinion You're comes? propagandizing on the show. No, we sir. We have those I'm requirements country. to protect your country by doing what? Doing what? By propagandizing against immigrants? What? Right. So, excuse me, Mansu. Show me how you protecting Guyanese by doing what? 
Are you asking and tell me to answer the question? I'm that asking you. Want me to answer? You're using a prejudicial terms incessantly. What are, you what are you? What are you protecting, Diana? I am saying to you. Okay, hold on. Are you want to allow me to answer? Or you want to answer for me? Yeah. Freddie Kisson, the Mr. Speaker said very, very clearly, very, very clearly, and I'll just paraphrase for him. He says, just let's show some hurdles up. That's all he said. Let's show some hurdles up. Hurdles in relation to what? <laughs> to people coming here to find a better life? Why when the man was talking, you were outside. I am saying... In fact, I started by saying that we should make it easy for a person to come here you heard and that? get a job. You heard that? No, but you didn't hear what the man said. I heard yes, what? But well. where the citizenship is concerned, we have to tighten up on that. The citizenship. Now, a person comes here... And what work, are you doing that for? And work illegally for 10 years. They can't become a citizen. You can't become a citizen illegally. Work right. Why even if you have a person lands here and they can get a I job don't have a problem with that. And then they, they easily get... You, are you going to listen? Right. Just, 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 wait, just, stop, just stop your xenophobia and anti-immigrant thing and listen. And listen and you'll understand. And there are two things I'm saying. I am saying... Because of the genetic nature of Guyanese, you're missing the point. I have yet. Let me finish. No, let me finish. Let us continue. Because you're gonna let me finish. Just no, we can't. You're gonna let me finish. We're gonna have fight here in the studio. You're gonna let me finish. <laughs> I'm not kidding, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker. Let us continue. Because Freddie, all oh, let us don't say that. Let us say. Say what, what you want. Huh? I it's can a good defend conversation. Myself. I'm glad. I, I can defend myself. Say what right, you want. I want to make a statement. I want to make a statement because for the people out there. Gildari is not xenophobic. That's the first thing. I am the be, I'm going to be the first one to say that. So you're guilty when you steal? What's that? So you say you're not xenophobic. Do you mean I believe you? Your opinion is your opinion. <laughs> are, are you going to allow me to say what they say? I'm not. Uh, what is my name? That was a David Himes. I'm not going to sit down and allow you to overwhelm me. Well, you are. Thank here. you very much. I right. am not going to allow you. To propagandize in this program and keep people who want to come in here. How long I am that? not going to allow you to do that. Is that the man who would <sighs> forgive me? I am not going to when, allow when he goes low, I go high. I am not um, going to allow you to sit down here. I have a right keep people to say that. Keep people I would from agree when with people like you, when sure. all your relatives and family are outside. I am not going to allow you to do it. Did they get there because they just walked through the door? So people walk into the door and come here. You know the hassle. You know the hassle in the you living here. You know the hassle people have. In, 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 the police hassle people get immigrants here. Those are the ones that are registered. Freddie so there's nothing um, wrong. I have there's seen. nothing wrong as me as Guyanese hmm. saying to us, and that is what I'm saying. You want to bring in workers, bring in workers. When it comes, when it comes to citizenship, that is where I was trying to say all the time. Don't make it just an overnight something. It has you. How do you know who's coming through? But that why command? are you saying that? Wait, you, you are denigrating the government and saying that. You're denigrating the laws of Guyana and saying that. And you're reducing Guyana because every country have their laws in which people come. They have to get work permit. They have to go to. I don't think you understand. You, the way you're behaving is as if people there's a deluge of illegal immigrants in this place taking over this place, and we got to put stringent measures. Which part are you every time? Ta so every time you say, when I'm you went on with every time I live in the last day you went in wrong. Yesterday, hospital. yesterday. You know what you're talking yes, about. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, Freddie Kissel knows what he's talking about. Yes, I, oh, you you know what I'm talking about more than what I am talking about. You know what you're talking about. Um, you are, you and I have he had, knows what he's talking. You and I have had this exchange with many guests here, and I'm telling well, I'm not standing I'm because tell, you have your opinion. Tell, your opinion is I'm, not the only opinion. I'm telling country. you. I'm telling you. You. I'm telling you to your face now. Many of your family members and relatives they are in another get, country. They did not go there. Just by gentlemen, gentlemen, that's gentlemen, not gentlemen. the point. We're spinning. We're that's spinning not the, the point. Mud, right? Thank you very much. Because we, we're just going wrong in a circle. Thank you it's very a much. Good conversation. Go to have. No, no, no. And I, um, Mansu, you have said this thing several times on this program. It was and I want to protect the phil philosophical foundation of people wanting a better No, life. you want to protect what Freddie Kisson thinks. I, I, want I, I don't have a problem with what you just said. That's why I'm saying make it easy for a person who wanted to come here. And let the law kick in when they want their citizenship. Why is that what we're saying? What are you talking about xenophobia? Right? 
It doesn't it's say that. Well, he, well, he said that about you, not me. Not Freddy, me. You because of how you were behaving. Because of how you were behaving. At the end of the day, Gilabi has a right to say, we defend our country the way that we want. That's my opinion. Mr. Speaker, coming back to the issue, you're in charge of parliament. Very important place. We have 65 members, and then also you sit there as the chairperson, as the man in charge. Are you happy with the number of sittings we have this year? Are the people, the representatives of this country, both from the opposition and from the government side, are they doing justice to the people of the island? They are. They're doing justice. Um, all Westminster system, Parliament meets at the pleasure of the government. Mm -hmm. That's a standard principle, right? The big countries, um, they literally have so much of work that they meet almost every day, but not necessarily the Parliament meeting every day. So, Parliament meets at the pleasure of the government. The agenda is put forward by the government. The order paper is established between the government and the clerk, and that goes up. Like, today, uh, the clerk and I went through four sets of questions almost, 80 questions from MPs that will be posed in the next 21 days when um, those mature and get on the order paper. The parliamentary committee system we have is the most robust one in the Caribbean, especially the um, English-speaking Caribbean from where we are. And we have those committees have to meet. Those committees have their work to do. We don't have another system like that in any other Caribbean country. When it comes to the management of the affairs of Parliament in terms of the sitting itself, it's another issue. It has been a testing and trying time to do that because there is a view that we have to have aggressive militancy in Parliament to get attention. And in fact, one of my very first remarks at Parliament was saying to everyone, because of social media, because of all the mm -hmm. social platforms we are on now, people are looking at you anytime, anywhere from their devices. So you have to be very responsible. And regardless of who says what, since the 1960s, this country has always hinged on a one or two seat majority. It hasn't changed. Yeah, it, hasn't. it hasn't changed in 60 years. So it's a fine line. That very fine line. And we talk about how the United Force revived. Yes, in 1992. In 1992, yeah, you allowed, you allowed the PPP to get a the people uh, didn't get a majority. You allowed that because right. you are yeah. And then, remember that. So it's always been very, very thin in terms of the majority. So minority governments in Guyana has been really the thing. Minority governments, you know. Um, I think the trend was bucked by Dr. Jagdio, President Jagdio. I think at that time it was 35 seats, I think, that he got, right? With a mm -hmm. solid majority. Yeah, uh, 2006. Yeah. Um, so, how you behave in Parliament, for me, civility, decency, courtesy, are the things that are going to win you the respect of people. Right? Mm. Um, aggressive militancy has its place. But not for you to disrupt decency and respect and democracy. And so, that is what we've had to manage in the last two years in Parliament? Well, um, well, if you look at Parliament from the time of the first election after the suspension of the Constitution, so that would be 57, mm -hmm. um, it would seem post-2020, there seemed to be a hardened feeling of disruption. Some of the things that went on in that place the past two years, I mean, uh, people, I know Dr. Jagan threw down the mace, and they were, but to have the opposition surround a speaker giving a formal speech and blowing whistle, 
to see a member of a parliament trying to grab the mace and then falling back right down with the mace and um, an official trying to protect the mace and a lady saying, you're a house slave. That has to be unprecedented in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, never happened before. Ne uh, never happened, apart from the Jamaat al Muslim Yeah, like they invaded. What? Right? Invading, but um, no. Well, we've seen other countries where a lot of aggressiveness happens, but not to the extent that we saw in our parliament. The, the disrespect that we saw mm -hmm. on the 29th of December 2021. And um, in that regard, I was very, very particular in saying, I have been lenient, I have been tolerant, we have allowed. It didn't happen the first time. It happened during the budget debate earlier, right? And we, we had to rein back in order in the house. So, in fact, um, I showed a lot of the responsibility for the suspension of those eight members because I insisted. Um, do you believe that our parliamentarians uh, should, there should be a level in which, uh, before they enter parliament, uh, that they reach that level, whether it's, I think there should be some qualification, they have read it and so on, but before they, they, they enter there, because there's, I have seen many criticisms as not only some of, a lot of them reading and so on, but uh, the, the way that they, they, they conduct themselves. I mean, if you as a normal Jew in the street, a kid in the street, name me 10 parliamentarians who are not government members, um, I think you might have some problems there. Um, uh, uh, because you see many of them torn up in parliament. Um, I, I have received complaints that it looks as if these people only torn up to collect the stipends, and then after them they're not there, they're not very vocal in the community, uh, they stay back and then only in parliament you will come. But I, my question to you, sir, should we hold them to a different standard? Should there be some kind of qualification system that is higher than the ones that we have right now? I, I, I wouldn't put that straitjacket on the selection of persons to be in Parliament. For me, what has to happen is a system where you have a hybrid. Citizens can identify with an MP that they elect. Mm -hmm. And that MP will also have some loyalty to their constituents. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to have the issue of proportional representation to give back some balance. And that is why I like the German system that has a parliament that changes. It's not fixed. But depending on the PR, it could go a few seats up or down. So you have a set of seats that are dedicated to constituencies. So Gildari will run from Medibank to Ramsburg and wins. Yes, he may win on a PPP ticket. But if he does things which will be detrimental to his constituents, then the party will have to look at the vetting system mm -hmm. to put up the Gildari again as the constituency candidate. And so that is the process that kicks in with respect to making people more accountable. But you have to have a hybrid system. I want, I want to ask you something now as um, an educated person with a political background and divorce yourself from the being Speaker of the National Assembly. In the United States, each senator, each House of Representatives, they have money to employ researchers. They have an office, they have a, a, a secretary, etc. So people go in there, and people complain of how their family being treated, about what's happening. I think the problem with Guyana, and I don't know if the oil money could solve this. I know the NDC councils and city and municipal councils don't do any work. But those people have their own full-time jobs. And as councillors, they're not paid anything much. Our parliamentarians do not have a research budget for each one of them. So they could set up an office in Mahaika with two researchers and then they, 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 they get their body of material and they could act in it. Don't you believe our municipal councillors, the NDC councillors and our parliamentarians, they should now be 
a financial outlay for each one of them? We have seen Jamaica, uh, Trinidad and Tobago with some form of allocation to their representatives. And I want to believe that that is going to be the evolutionary path in our own parliament. That there will be resources allocated right now. It's the resources of the entire parliament available to every MP. So it's not that persons are without. Many MPs come every day, use the services of the, the parliament, research, type letters, print letters, use the internet. That's a service. centralized office. They don't, have centralized. Their own, they don't have their own research office yeah. in Mahaika or, or then I'm well, constituency office, yeah, yeah, not necessarily yeah. a research yeah, yeah, office. Yeah. Right? yeah, the constituency office. The constituency where they have a staff. Where and and I, I, I see a progression into that system. We've seen it in many other countries that has taken some time and I don't doubt you will see it. As the speaker here, sitting now as the speaker here, you can't comment on certain political issues, can you? I, 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 I want to ask, but I want to get the format correct before. You could ask, and I could choose yeah, uh, to um, not answer or dance around the oh, issue. Okay. Um, I am not satisfied mm -hmm. that we've had a patriotic outpouring from different classes, different ethnicities, and different social dimensions of the Guyanese society about what happened in March 2020. A lot of civil society groups that we just expect automatically to say, no, this can happen. There's been, a, there's been a very disappointing social expression about what happened March 2020. Very, Leonard, it's not only March 2020. If you go back to the genesis of the St. Lucia Statement and the Hardmanson Accord, it was no different. Could you imagine you have Yu Chumley as head of the observer mission, right? Have facts at his fingertips because he was there. And then some issue broke out on the counting. And now he now steps out of that and calls me and says, I know he's dead, um, God rest his soul, and sorry, Kathy, but this is history. And now wants to broker, to be a broker among this, um, the, the issues that were happening on the street. And I said to him, well, you were an observer, you were there, why can't you come out and speak the truth? It's no different in March 2020. No different. So, persons find it very difficult to divorce themselves from their own uh, cocoon which they're comfortable in, to step out and call a spade a spade. And that is, for me, the big issue. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help a young population like Guyana. People are looking for leadership. People are looking for examples. That is why sports people are so important. They act as... Um, you know, examples. I, I fully endorse endorse that comment with respect to the one thing that unifies is sport. The one thing that unifies is sport and cuts across everything. I think the president was have been speaking about sport today yeah. um, about the how important it is and, and, and the joy and the pride that it is. Mr. Speaker, on a different issue. But let me just uh, let me sure. just add. Um, we just came back from a international parliamentary union conference in Kigali, Rwanda, and that was an, more than an eye-opening experience. You know, you saw how cruel man can be to man, but at the, on the other side, you saw how compassionate man could be to man. So you had a million people being slaughtered in a hundred days, 10,000 people a day, and the entire country literally stunk with rotting human flesh, you know. Thirty years later, Kigali itself is like a little Switzerland. And so those are some lessons uh, we could learn, but one of the things we have to do is to move around. Reading it on Google and uh, in books is one thing. Going and living and speaking with people and seeing what is happening is another. Mm -hmm. so, 
Mr. Speaker, I, I remember a couple of years back reading about, I think it's Kamala B. Cesar. Mm -hmm. In her cabinet, uh, she fired, I think it was almost like a dozen ministers, including, I think, the education minister and so on. And that kind of amazed me because every week it would not go by then the newspaper reporting that the minister's fired. Do you think we have a culture in Guyana that probably needs change in that uh, we seem to have uh, a culture of, um, you know, banding around somebody who might be uh, a little under, um, um, under pressure, might have committed something, that we need to change that culture? Have we been uh, uh, too tolerant? Have we been too protective of the ones who are probably given us a bad name, who committed the crimes and then the party get blamed um, of tolerating? I want to hear your thoughts because as we move into the next level of being maybe a first world country, we need to start changing that when people commit crimes, when people do wrong things in office, we need to call them out and say you need to step down because this, our country, our people, they're not going to tolerate it. I think we have a culture of sanctions. We do have a culture of sanctions. It might not be as publicly um, open as some people would like, but we do have a culture of sanctions. And where politicians are concerned, within your party there is a lot of sanctioning. Um, and so sometimes... It might not be in the open. Uh, sometimes some of the things are not for public consumption, right? But there is a culture of sanctions, and that culture keeps people to do the right thing in service to their country. I don't want to talk on the um, on a matter that's before the court. I think that would be very disrespectful to you because those people have the opposition have asked the court mm -hmm. that you're, you're ban and the ban on them. The one incident that I would like to get your thought on because the ERC, the Ethnic Relations Commission, was never brought in. I don't know of the time the Ethnic Relations Commission was functioning. But when your assistant was holding on to protect the maze. And Miss Philadelphia was, was videotaped calling him a house slave. Shouldn't, um, shouldn't the Ethnic Relations Commission be called in? In fact, um, you would be surprised to know that uh, his report of that incident went into the ERC uh, within a couple of days. So it's there. It's, it's there. No, there's no, um, but the, the ERC, um, we had some issues with it. it the process of uh, renaming a new, RC, new ERC mm -hmm. is ongoing and should be completed, uh, I would say, um, in the not too distant future because I know they have had elections in the last week for representatives from religious organizations, youth, um, and other groups. So the composition of the ERC, um, the new, ER, new ERC will come to Parliament shortly. I'm confident about that. And it's not a case that's dead. So his request for redress against that particular incident is and was lodged. And uh, there could be sanctions against that lady? Uh, it is um, that incident was one of the incidents we used, yes, already. So sanction has been um, imposed. Okay. Um, what are your plans? You have any, you're the latest speaker. You have any, um, you have any strategies, plans um, to make the parliament different from what it was the past 50, 60 years? You have to be able to be fair in your judgment. You have to run the house in a manner that will instill confidence of our sides. And for me, that is the challenge that we have, and that is what I'm firmly focused on. Um, and we're going to get criticized from every side. But if I remain firmly fixed on principle, I think in the end, we'll have a better parliament. So, this is the third year we are about to start um, when this session resumes. So, 
I'm going to be fixed on that. I'll keep a strong eye out on the committees because committees are mm -hmm. a reflection of the parliament. And we've seen in some committees some issues that need to have the intervention of the speaker. And uh, the other issue is to educate our people about the role, responsibility of the elected representatives and create more access of our citizens to the MPs. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things which I, I um, would do. The, I've heard people say, I, I, I look at the news all the time and I see it in other parliaments, but that raucous heckling, uh, sometimes it descends really so terrible that Guyana is different, it makes Guyana different from the rest of the Commonwealth. I mean, parliaments have their thing, but sometimes you can't hear a speaker when he's, he or she's talking. Yes, I, think also, we, I have to tighten up on that. It's, it's a valid criticism of the speakership, and we have to tighten up on it. The, the issue is this. It becomes so obnoxious that you might end up putting everybody out. So that's the thing. So, um, but it's, it's an area where definitely fairness and firmness have to be the two key words in managing the parliament. Uh, aside from your hat as a speaker, you are also, um, I would say, a politician. Uh, would you say that uh, the country should be disappointed that, in that the opposition, the government and the opposition, are not finding more grounds for um, common interest when I say our country is going through a very um, important, uh, or it is at an important crossroad at the moment with oil and gas and so on? and that we could collaborate on some things. Are you disappointed? Should the country be disappointed that we not find a more common grounds to work together? It's not easy. It's difficult. And I think the only example we could draw from was um, Ireland, right? When Labour, the politicians and the business persons, they sat and they came up with particular strategies, right, that didn't change much. The persons change. And so 30 years ago, they had a lot of this discussion. But the start of it has to be a conversation. The start of it has to be a conversation. So the Irish experience is one which we can draw from. And, you know, we shouldn't fight over what salary increases should be. We shouldn't fight over what worker safety should be. We shouldn't fight over what uh, one Guyana should be border issues and things like that. So there are many, many areas where the conversation um, has to continue. I know we have seen a lot of hand reaching and no hand shaking, you know, but this, this has to happen. And sometimes no matter what you tell people, you have to still experience the process before you get to the solution. You say, um Ask anything, you will determine if you, how you respond, if you want to respond. I think most people in the world, when they examine the GCOM format, the GCOM structure, would, would ask so many questions. To have three commissioners from one particular party, um, when says Conrad was here, I, 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 I asked him this question. Now, if you know you from the polls, from the rallies, that you're going to lose an election. And you have three persons in that commission. What's to stop them from disrupting it? Do you know in the 2015 election, somebody, and it had to be people with access, they say it's, it came from the, 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 the party commissioners, they found fake statements of polls. Um, I, I'm asking you, are you happy with that kind of format? It's not the format, you know. The tree tree one, I'm happy with it. I think that the, the politicians should adjudicate the rules, right? But it's what happens within the management of the system. And I've been involved in it, and I'm not pleased with what happened in 2015. I'm not pleased with what happened in 2020. I, I did. I was assistant election agent for Region Four, one of the four, and we sat with Mingo 
for two, three hours, you know, before he's going to do this, that, and on the day of Paul it was a different story. Very different story, but a familiar story, because I've seen this so many times before. All the platitudes were given, all the respect was shown, and then the breakdown, right? So, it's the management of the system. You know, when you have uh, some horror stories in 20, 20 March, it, but was very similar to 1980, 1985, mm -hmm. right? You know, 1980, the polling station was in the Chowman factory yard in Albaistan. The guy comes up, a Shuri, one of the Shuri family comes up and vote to vote for somebody else. I know him, we grew up together. You make an objection and then 10 minutes later you see a mob ready to beat you up. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. The ladies and them being advised <laughs> yes. that it is time. Um, Mr. Speaker, very quickly, if you want to say anything to the guy, these people now is the time to say it. Uh, uh, the floor is just a couple of seconds, 30 seconds or so. But both um, Freddie, Leonard and our people, I strongly believe that we have to have a lot of tolerance um, and learn what you can make your members of parliament do for you. It's not a case where you can have access to them. And if you can't get them, get me. Right? But use the system to register your concerns. Look, I, and I want to take some credit. When Minister Edgel was speaking about the works being done, railway embankment, to the north, I said, Hey, don't forget, we got a place called Independence Boulevard mm -hmm. on Trench. And what I see happening there yeah, today, you know, and, and I was surprised how easy it was for people to move off their structures on the boulevard. Even my barber at School Street, you know, he was, I saw him on TV saying, man, look, does me business get moved, but it's for the betterment, right? And so tolerance and access your MPs. You don't have to always go to your MP through the party. Access them directly. And if we have to make more avenues available for you to get to your members of parliament, let us know. We, our social media platform in parliament is very active. After the first year, we had about 1.8 million hits. And a lot of that were the younger people. And so I remember during the first budget debate I had COVID and we got we got one one um one question from a young viewer and of course you're only seeing here. So the young viewer said, um, we wanted the speaker has on pants. Right? <laughs> yes. You know yes. but at least they were watching, right? Yes. <laughs> they were watching. And so um, our speaker's National Youth Debating Competition has activated a lot of young interests. The Youth Parliament that we continued, uh, we're going to take the Youth Debating Competition to the regions next year instead of just centralizing it here. It's going to go to the region. We're going to do a lot more outreaches to people itself. So there's a lot that the citizen can do to make their MPs and the Parliament itself more responsible. Your Parliament, we got to go now, but Parliament does advertising, they put things in the papers. Gildari has a business, the advertising boards at, up the East Bank there, so please patronize I Gildari. I didn't hire him to do this advertising. Let a record show. <laughs> but tell you anything very quickly? No, no, um, we took up, we took up, um, we took up some of the speaker's time, so let him... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it is good to disagree. It is also good to hear the different views. And today we would have heard from a uh, man who has institutional knowledge and very important man, critical in the system of law uh, lawmaking in the end, in charge of the parliament, the speaker. I want to thank uh, Mr. Manso Nadir for turning up and of course bearing with us. But it is what it is. As we move forward, we're going to agree to disagree. It's going to be very rapturous at time because it is not going to be an easy road that we walk, uh, but we want to see a better country. I think all of us sitting in this room here and 
every one of you who's, who are watching us from wherever you're watching us from, uh, we are going to have to um, think about it very carefully. We're going to have to push our politicians, our leader, to do a little better. If you're on the roadways tonight, uh, we want to uh, appeal to you, as always, please uh, drive responsibly. Please walk responsibly. You have to do it. You have to do it for us, for the country. We will be back with you on Friday evening, as always. Um, uh, it is, you're not sure, I think um, there is going to be a very important guest. Are we going to speak a little about cricket, among other things? Have a pleasant rest of the evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to say thank you again to our speaker, um, Mr. Mansur Nadir, the co-host, Freddie Kisun. Good evening. Thank you, buddy.